everyone. Welcome to this YouTube channel. Today, uh, for you, I have Anthony Lewis, and we will be talking about Antissia and Contra Antissia, two very old concepts used in Hellenistic astrology. Anthony is an astrologer, a researcher. I don't think he really does consultations, maybe for uh, his close ones, but he's not really a practicing uh, astrologer, but he's a uh, researcher, has been into astrology since the 80s. Um, he's a retired uh, psychiatrist. He also has a major in mathematics and so on. So Anthony, very welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. I asked you to talk a little bit about Antissia and Contra Antissia, two concepts that I think are very fascinating. Why? Because there's a strong astronomical foundation for it and they seem to go back a long time, perhaps to the early stages of zodiac development. I've also seen it play out in my horoscope. I first became aware of the concept reading William Lilly back in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And Lilly, he's a 17th century horror astrologer, general astrologer too. But he used them in horror charts, and he has some examples in his book, mm -hmm. uh, as another way that two planets could connect. Mm -hmm. In horror, often what you look at is, does the planet that signifies the querent, the person who asked the question, connect in some way to what they're asking about? Mm -hmm. For example, will I have a relationship with so-and-so? Well, the I would be the first house, the, the planet that signifies the first house. And yeah. the so-and-so they want the relationship would be the seventh house across the way. And if those planets are approaching conjunction or trine or sextile, you'd say, oh, yeah, it looks like a good relationship, a square or an opposition. You say, well, yeah, there'll be a relationship, but there'll be some tension to it. Or, uh, but if there's, if they're not approaching each other by a traditional aspect, sextal, trine, square, opposition, conjunction was not considered an aspect, but it's included. Then Lily or her astrologer would look, well, is there some other way they're connecting? And one of those other ways would be the anti-scion, which is basically each planet has reflection across the solstitial axis, the solstices, zero, mm -hmm. Uh, Capricorn to zero cancer yeah it's it's kind of reflection across the way and if it's reflection where the, we're participating in a traditional aspect then you would say yes that could bring about a connection between the two people mm -hmm. and so I, the concept certainly goes back to at least 2,000 years or longer before that um, there are references in the Hellenistic literature to Hipparchus using antiscions, and he yeah. was second century BC. He mm -hmm. established the tropical zodiac. Uh, so we know it, it at least goes back that far, and probably further. Now, initially, it has to do with the development of astrology, which. <laughs> Very, very briefly, Alexander the Great brought the ideas from Persia, Babylonia, to Egypt and Greece, and the Greeks in Alexandria really developed the Hellenistic approach. And in doing so, they incorporated into astrology the culture of the times, the philosophy of the times, going back to Empedocles, Pythagoras, Plato, so all these ideas had a role in forming how we view astrology. For example, the, the traditional aspects, what we call the Ptolemaic aspects, you know, the mm -hmm. sextal trine, et cetera, they really derived from ideas of Pythagoras about numbers, ratios of numbers, musical theory, you're a musician, mm -hmm. and Plato who talked about so the perfection of certain geometric forms. And so all of the aspects that connect signs, theoretically in astrology, are could be conceived of as, in terms of regular polygons that could be inscribed in a circle. For example, the trine is a perfect triangle. Mm -hmm. The square was a perfect square. <laughs> the opposition is just straight line. The um, 
what did I leave out? The sextal is a side of a hexagram. Yes. And these are all perfect, regular polygons that fit inside a square. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're not a perfect, regular hex, uh, polygon, then they don't count as connecting the sides. Mm -hmm. um, so in Hellenistic times, the, the most important way that signs were connected was through these major aspects. If they weren't connected, then they were considered in a version or in conjunct or disjunct or disconnected. And so the most important sign was the ascendant because you were born, you come into the world at the ascendant. And the ascendant represents the person, the native who's born. And so all the signs that have an aspect to the ascendant can be helpful to the ascendant, the person in his, his or her development. But there'll always be four signs that are not connected by a, a major aspect to the ascendant. There'll be the two signs adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. So if you think of the ascendant as the first house, it would be the 12th and the second house won't be connected by aspect. And then if you look across the way, the, the um, sixth and the eighth houses, six and the eighth signs, think of whole signs, won't be connected to the ascendant. So those signs are sort of doing their own thing and not necessarily keeping in mind the needs of the person. And so they can be harmful because they're not coordinated with the development of the individual. Yes. And so the sixth could be illness, the eighth could be death or serious near-death experience. Mm. The twelfth was considered a very unfortunate house, secret enemies, exile. The second, you know, we think of it now as income, money, but uh, the, the Hellenistic astrologers called it the gate of Hades, the gate to hell. So I, <laughs> mm -hmm. They had a very interesting view of the second house. And in addition, the Hellenistic astrologers sort of connected signs that were in opposition. So the second is connected to the eighth because they're in opposition, they're sort of a spectrum. And so the second could indicate death as well as the eighth yes. through this opposition. Mm -hmm. So it could be harmful in that way. And in fact, often if you look at the charts of the famous people who die, the second house is activated or there's a aspect to the second house cusp or something like that. yeah in vedic astrology the second house is um what is called a maraka which is a killer mm. it's really a killer okay and so yeah. how they go about is the eighth house is the house of life force mm -hmm. and then the 12th from there is um you know the seventh right and that's also considered a maraka and then they say the eight from the eight is the third and the 12th from there is the second oh okay so there's, yeah, so there's a yeah. similar idea because 6, 8, and 12 are these um, dushtana. Yeah. Um, difficult. So it's a very, it sounds like there was a sharing of ideas yeah. between Vedic and Hellenistic there. Mm -hmm. um, so then it became important. If you have a chart where, say, an important planet is in 2, 6, 8, or 12, uh, and you want to, is that planet going to really be harmful to the native or not? Mm -hmm. You look for other connections. And so the other connections in the Hellenistic literature, I mean, the two most prominent are if the same planet rules both signs, mm -hmm. then that's good because you've got the same planet managing both houses. And as the manager, he won't let the planet in the averse house do too much harm. Right. So, for example, Aries and Scorpio are in six to eight um, position, right, exactly. but they share the same uh, Lord. So in that sense, it becomes, it right. mitigates. Yeah. They share the same Lord. And if that Lord is in good condition, he's, he or she is going to make things work well for the native, despite mm -hmm. the fact that there's not a as, aspect to the ascendant. Yes. And the other way was this, this sy symmetrical way. And depending on who you read and when they wrote their different ideas. And I think what happened is until Hipparchus, who established the tropical zodiac, there wasn't a clear sense of the sidereal zodiac being different from the tropical zodiac. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
so, um, so for example, I, I have some slides I can go to, but first let me talk about it. Sure. So, uh, so that if you read Manilius, who's a wrote about the time of Christ, very about zero fourteen A.D. He writes about anti-scions as signs. Well, first of all, that you can have signs that are symmetrical or points within signs that are symmetrical. Yeah, that was one of my questions, yeah. though. What, what came first? Yeah, I, th I think what came first was the signs from right. my reading the literature. Hmm. Again, I might be wrong on this because I haven't read everything. But my sense, it was the signs. Mm -hmm. And... But the signs in an odd way because initially the solstices, Cancer Capricorn, were considered, at least in my reading of it, almost whole sign. It was as if the whole sign was the solstice, not just the point within the sign. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in Babylonian times, that the Babylonian or Chaldean information that went to Alexandria was very observational. And they would note that the sun seemed to stop in the sky. But in six, 800 years before Christ, it would stop in the sky, have a solstice in the middle of Capricorn and in the middle of Cancer. They regarded the solstice axis as a whole sign, not as the the point in the middle. The whole sign was the axis. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a whole sign astrology. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. It's like where the, it's like whole sign aspects. Where the planet is within the sign really isn't that important. It's what is the aspect between the two signs. So, for example, uh, if you have a planet at the very beginning of Aries and another planet at the very end of Cancer, almost in Leo, as points, they're almost exactly 120 degrees apart. They're in trine. Mm -hmm. But you ignore that in whole sign astrology. Right. And mm -hmm. you say, oh, no, they're in square aspect. Manilius objects to this. He says, this makes no sense. If you went one minute further, they would be a perfect trine. So how could you say they're in square? He says that in his poem. Yes, made that, that makes sense. So, but you mentioned that, um, what was it, six to 700 BC, we had the solstice uh, axis in the middle of, smack in the middle of the sign. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, depending on the Ionamsa you pick, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I'm using that figure based on the charts in Vedius Valens. Mm -hmm. And I can show you, maybe I should do that. I, I made a bunch of slides. I don't want to go through all of them because I'm just trying to understand this myself. So, but they, they looked at the solstice um, being the whole sign, right? So the, the whole sign they, of... They, the way they write about it, it's as if the solstice is the whole sign. The, the solstice is Cancer. The solstice is Capricorn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the symmetry then is the sign before Cancer and the sign after Cancer. In other words, before Cancer is Gemini, after Cancer is Leo. So those were considered the two signs that were symmetrical. But at, mm -hmm. and and it was true, six or eight hundred BC. But it it isn't true in the tropical zodiac, <laughs> because yes. in the tropical zodiac zero Cancer and zero Capricorn yeah. form the axis, yes. and so all of Cancer is symmetrical to all of Gemini. So there's this discrepancy in the literature. The early literature will say that Gemini pairs with Leo. Mm -hmm. They're symmetrical because they're using the sidereal zodiac at, from Babylonian times. Yes, okay. It's mm -hmm. very time specific. Yeah. But as the concept evolved and people began using the specific axis between two points rather than two signs, and began using more the tropical zodiac as Lily did, then what is symmetrical to Cancer is Gemini. Yes. Okay. So the old, old texts are going to say Gemini is symmetrical to Leo, which was true about 800 years before Christ. They observed it. Okay, so this, there's a site on the internet where you can pick a city and it will map the, the amount of daylight each day of the year in that spot for one year. 
Mm -hmm. So I picked New York City. Mm -hmm. The longest day of the year is June 21st. Right. And so the most light of any day of the year will occur on June 21st. The day will be the longest. And yes. then as you move away from June 21st, the days get shorter. And so here we're at the first degree of cancer, cancer, right? We're in summer. And so we're going through cancer. The days are getting shorter and shorter. But leading up to June 21st, we're starting in Gemini and approaching the end of Gemini. The days are getting longer. And so what's symmetrical is say this point here sometime in late Gemini corresponds to this point over here sometime in early Cancer. And those yes. are considered solstice points or anti-science, reflections of each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. If we were in Babylonia, we would look up in the sky and on June 21st, we'd say, this is the longest day of the year. Where is the sun? We'd look in the heavens, you know, in the, at twilight or dawn, and we'd say, oh, this, this point in here, maybe 800 years before Christ, is right in the middle of cancer. Yeah. It's in the middle of the crab. It's not the beginning. It's not at the end. So that they then said, well, cancer is a solstitial sign, and it's a cardinal sign in the sidereal zodiac. Now, the problem with that logic is the... The solstice is moving backwards in time about one degree every 72 years, mm -hmm. is the precession. So at some point in the future, the solstice is going to pass from Cancer back into Gemini, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that at some point in the future, Gemini will be the solstitial sign, and Gemini will become a cardinal sign, mm -hmm. which sort of runs counter to the way we think about it, right? We think of yes. Gemini as mutable. <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it's mutable in the tropical zodiac. Yes, in the sense, yeah, of the tropical. Yeah, exactly. And it always will be because it's the final month of the season. Mm -hmm. Because solstices and equinoxes determine the four seasons. It's really a concept from tropical astrology. And so the early literature mixes up the zodiac in terms of seasons and the zodiac in terms of fixed stars. And it's kind of jumbled together. Oh, it's it's perfectly clear. It's yeah. just also to show the transition because they saw they observed it and they saw okay, um, the solstice happens in the middle of Cancer. It happened in a particular year in mm. history in the middle of Cancer, but it didn't stay there because every seventy-two years it moves one degree. Yes. So this is you know using sidereal coordinates. And then down here, the shortest day of the year is about December twenty second, twenty third, the first day of winter, which is the winter solstice. Mm -hmm. The sun again appears to stand still, and then it starts moving upward. It moves upward till it stops June twenty first, and begins to move downward, and this continues. Okay. Yes. Um, so this slide is. You can see if we use zero Capricorn and zero Cancer as the axis, mm -hmm. then what are symmetrical are Capricorn and Sagittarius, Aquarius and Scorpio. In the old literature, the sidereal literature, the symmetry was with regard to the whole sign, not to mm -hmm. the axis. So there's this discrepancy in the literature. And there, there were astrologers and astronomers and people who objected. And this... This diagram here simply shows, here's the axis, zero, Cancer, Capricorn. Any planet here, there's a point equidistant on the other side of the axis that is its anti-scion or its reflection. Yeah, I know sia means shadow in Greek. Right. So it's a shadow cast by an object. This would be a skia, a shadow. Mm -hmm. You put an object in the sun, like for a sundial, and you get a shadow. Mm -hmm. And so there's two days of the year when the shadows are sort of equal and opposite. Those are anti-scion days. Yes. Well, I learned a new word doing this. <laughs> I was trying to find a word in English that used skia as a root. And the only one I could find was skiomancy, which is divination by consulting the shades of the dead. Again, the idea of shade or shadow. Mm -hmm. So the anti-scions are points that reflect each other as in a mirror across the um, solstitial axis. 
And if the basic idea is symmetry, if they're symmetrically located, they have an affinity toward one another, they have a similarity, mm. and that's good. Because if you and I are alike, if we have something in common, we can use that to connect with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so according to the literature, Parkus mentions them, Maternus cites him, Manilius, whom I quoted, uses the middle, but he, I think he's basing it on the Babylonian observation that the solstices at Babylonian times were occurring in the middle of Cancer and Capricorn. Using, I'll show you the chart from Valens where I used to calculate it back to 630 BC. This is based on Vedius Valens. Uh, Ptolemy did not discuss Anticia, but he talked about commanding and obeying signs. But even in Ptolemy, he gives a definition that doesn't make astronomical sense. Mm -hmm. which is surprising because he also advocated the tropical zodiac. So I, I don't quite understand what he was thinking, but he was not a practicing astrologer. Yes. And the most, I think, the best example is from Firmicus Maternus, and I'm going to talk about that. I have slides. So here is an example from Vedius Valens in the second century. So he's writing, well, this chart is from the year one. 114 of the common era. And so this is the tropical, I calculated in the tropical zodiac, and the sun is at 20 Taurus 39. Mm -hmm. The figures Vedius Valens gives in his book are that the sun is at 25 Taurus 18. So that he's clearly using a sidereal zodiac, not a tropical one. Mm, yes. And the difference is four degrees, 39 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I projected that backwards using one degree for every 72 years and arrived at 630 BC is when the solstices were in the middle of Cancer and Capricorn. Mm -hmm. So based on the zodiac that Vedius Valens was using in the year 114 AD, I just used the difference between the tropical zodiac, his zodiac, and I backed up his zodiac one degree, 72 years for every degree, back to 15 degrees of cancer. So that seemed to be the zodiac that he was using. Right. There's a guy, a Roman guy named Columuela, who I never heard of before. But I, in doing my research to talk to you, I found that he wrote this book on agriculture. He was a Roman farmer and soldier. Mm -hmm. He says, and he's writing in the first century, Winter begins eight days before January 1st. That is when the sun is in the eighth degree of Capricorn. So he's now putting yeah. the winter solstice at eight degrees of Capricorn, mm -hmm. which is a, one of the, ba ba the Babylonians in the literature had used eight or 10. There's, there's two traditions. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm not impressed with Hipparchus who taught that the solstices and equinoxes do not occur in the eighth degree, but rather in the first degree of the signs. Yes. So he's dismissing. He says, that's nonsense. We all know it's the eighth degree. Very interesting, yeah. And see, here's where Manilius is using the middle Cancer Capricorn as the axis, mm -hmm. and then the symmetry is either side of the solstitial sign. Right. Mm -hmm. But astronomically, in the tropical zodiac, this doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Even yes. at the time of Manilius, by observation, it didn't make sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and Ptolemy says essentially the same thing, uh, which again makes no sense because, did I quote Ptolemy? Yeah. Ptolemy talks about commanding and obeying signs at equal distances to the same equinoctial sign, not, not axis, uh, mm -hmm. because they ascend in equal periods of time. But it's not true that signs equidistant from the equinoctial signs. It's equidistant to the equinoctial axis, axis yes. in, the same, in the same period of time. So Ptolemy should have known better. <laughs> and so he has a correct definition, but he gives a wrong explanation. The, an anti-scion or an anti -C are signs or points. So they can be signs or points. Initially, I think they were signs, then they got in specific points. Mm -hmm. Equidistance from the solstitial degrees, although initially they talked about solstitial signs. But I think the correct definition is from the particular degrees. They're reflections of one another. Uh, because they're equidistant, 
the amount of light on each day is the same and is a source of power. So they were called signs of equal power. If you have as much light as I have, we have equal power. If I have more light than you, I'm a commanding sign. I have more power than you because you're in the dark, right? Interesting. Because we also have contra antisia, which is then... Right. Contra antisia, it's the reverse. The amount of daylight in one point is equal to the amount of nighttime in the other. Maternus, here's, this is the version of Maternus. The way he talks about it is it's as if the, the antisia of planets are stand-ins or substitutes for the planets themselves. Mm -hmm. Much like the nodes are shadows, but they function as planets. Mm -hmm. uh, so these shadows function as planets. They can take the place of planets. And so connections to them are just as if there was a connection to the planet. And if you take them all around the wheel, they form a kind of hidden horoscope within the horoscope. Kind of like what you do in Vedic astrology, where you look at the Vargas. You're looking at charts that are kind of hidden or implicit within the, the birth chart. He's regarding the Anticia as a kind of chart within a chart. So here's a natal chart inside, and, uh, and then the, the red are the Anticia outside. So we can see in this chart, we have Venus, very prominent, this you know, very close to the midheaven degree. Uh, and it's dignified in Pisces. Its anti-scion is the Lord, is the ruler of Libra. So it's, Venus is extremely dignified in this chart. So you expect this person to have Venus as a very prominent part of their life and career because of the connection of the midheaven. Yes. But the other planet that stands out is Mars for a couple of reasons. Uh, natally, Mars is angular also, as is Venus. It's right on the descendant. Mm -hmm. So it's very angular. And almost all the anti-scion degrees of the planets fall in either Scorpio or Aries. So that mm -hmm. Mars is in charge of all these anti-scions. And the anti-scions stand in for all the planets. So this yeah. person would be very strongly Martian and very strongly Venusian. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. so Makes I think sense. I, I yeah. use the phrase to you, this would be a, a musical warrior. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. I think it's, uh, you know, um, Anthony, the way I came about it um, was whenever I have the sun transiting Aries, mm -hmm. It's always a good time for me. Well, to Saturn, I would be like a little more difficult and challenging, of course, but... Saturn, Moon, Mars, Jupiter, and the North Node. Yeah, especially when these points are hit by... Um, when Jupiter is hit and so on, because I've tested yeah. it out. It seems to work really well, and that's why I got really interested in this uh, concept, because yeah. it seems to be very well, accurate. Well, the, the month of Aries should be extremely active, because... It's the tenth house of the natal chart. Yeah, I think active is a better word to say it. It's a mixture yeah. of you know we have all this benefic and else as well a malefic yeah. uh, stuff. A, a huge focus on career advancement in the world and incredible activity because all these planets are getting stimulated. Do you also look at aspects like um, or do you look at conjunctions in the later literature in Lily and Horary? They mainly looked at the conjunctions and oppositions, but in in um, Firmicus Maternus, he looks at all the aspects, all the major aspects. All the major aspects, and okay. And he looks at whole sign aspects. <laughs> Do you have um, experience with this in your own chart and charts of people you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't always look at it, but when something's puzzling, I will look at it. And in yeah. horary charts, I like to look at it just to be sure I'm not missing something. And I have some examples I can show uh, right. So yeah. let, let me go along. The contra antisia were considered sign. Oh, the antisia were considered to see each other because they're reflections like in a mirror. Yes. The contra antisia, which are more up and down, were considered to be able to hear each other. Yeah, which is along the uh, equinoctical um, right. axis. Yeah. Uh, and I think I have an understanding of why that's true. Let's see. Anti signs see or behold each other. You look like this is my wording. This isn't from anybody's. This is just how I was thinking about it. 
Mm -hmm. We look like me. We must belong to the same tribe. We have a lot in common. Maybe we could help each other. Mm -hmm. The contrary science hear or resonate with each other, like musical instruments. You sound like me. When I listen to you, it seems like I could be the one talking. We communicate well. We could be friends. Oh, so contrary to science are not, um, you know, per se negative. Uh, in horror, Lily said they acted like squares and oppositions. Mm -hmm. But in the older Hellenistic literature, they were used in looking at synastry between people. So if we have a contra anti scion contact between our two charts, mm -hmm. probably when you speak, I will listen and I will understand and vice versa. So we can connect around similar ideas, sharing of information. Oh, mm -hmm. it's an interesting concept. I think all this needs to be tested out. So this is the path of the sun during the year. Mm -hmm. This is the equator. So half the year it's above the equator, half the year it's below the equator. Yes. It switches at the solstices and it meets the equator at the equinoxes. And so the anti scion signs are the ones that are parallel to the equator on this line. Those are all the reflections. Mm -hmm. This point reflects this point. This point reflects this point. If we look at reflections up and down, which is, you can't really do it on this graph, but uh, let me. Okay. This is just the zodiac in the heavens. Here's the equinoxes. And what I did was I put the anti sign signs either side of the solstitial axis. Here's the solstices, mm -hmm. here's the equinox. So Gemini reflects Cancer, Taurus reflects Leo, Aries reflects Virgo. And they're looking, the eyes here, I mean, they're looking across. Mm -hmm the solstitial axis parallel to the equator, parallel to the equinox. Yes. Mm -hmm. Pisces reflects Libra, Aquarius reflects Scorpio, Capricorn reflects Sagittarius. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we saw that one already. This is just to repeat what I said earlier. Initially, th they dealt with whole sign aspects and only signs that were connected by whole sign aspects could be helpful to each other. Mm -hmm. And these are the four whole sign aspects. So that the eighth, the second, and I didn't put them down here. The sixth don't aspect the ascendant. They can't be very helpful. Yes. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to show here was the pairs across the way are the anti science and they can, they look at each other. Yes. The pairs up and down are the contra anti science and they hear each other. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, Aries here sees Virgo. Aries hears Pisces. Virgo hears Libra and vice versa. Aries and Pisces are equal rising because they're on opposite sides of the equator. So the, the rising, the ascensional times are the same for each. Uh, and I think that's why they were considered hearing because in the ideas of Pythagoras, if two strings are of equal length and of equal tension, they will resonate with each other. That's, that's very interesting. So here, the signs that are equal rising, so they have the same length, the same tension, resonate with each other musically and hear each other. Uh, that's my theory. I didn't read that anywhere, but as I'm reading between the lines of these texts, that's what occurred to me. Oh yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. And also, some of the authors, I think Paulus and Rhetorius, talk about the equal rising signs representing good communication, good verbal communication, gossip. Yep. Uh, so it's interesting in terms of interpretation. So where does the negative connotation come from? Contra uh, yeah. It comes from the opposition. Mm -hmm. Oh, let yes. Me, mm -hmm. let, let me go on. I just... To show non-visually, I took the summer solstice this year in Alexandria, Egypt, where all this developed, <laughs> and mm -hmm. I calculated the rising times of all the signs. And you can see that Aries rises the same as Pisces, blah, 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 Virgo as Libra, and so on. Mm -hmm. and these are the pairs of equal rising signs. So these are the contra-anti-science signs yes. that, that hear or resonate with each other 
because they rise in the same amount, length of time. Mm, yes. And they, so they vibrate in unison. This means you look across parallel to the equator or mm -hmm. the uh, equinoxes. You listen parallel to the solstices. And here's this figure. Let's have him, her, him or her. It's a he, right? Cupid is a he. Yes. Start in Aquarius. So he's rising up here. His anti-scion, as he looks across, is this reflection. Interesting, it's upside down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so it's not a, a sort of one-to-one -one reflection. He's looking at himself. It's exactly the same size, but the feet here reflect the head here and so on. Yes. And you yes. come down here, same guy. He can hear Scorpio, and Scorpio can hear him. He can't see Scorpio because Scorpio's way the other side of the equator, uh, but he can see him. I think the reason they, they have seen going across the equator is when at the equinoxes, the sunlight is going directly across the equator. And so there are streams of sunlight along the lines of latitude of the earth. And so in terms of opposition, yes, let's take the box here. Aries sees Virgo. Yes. Pisces sees Libra. Mm -hmm. Virgo hears Libra. Aries hears Pisces. This point in Aries is directly opposite Libra on the ecliptic, on the, in the zodiac. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, God, this isn't something I read, but as I put it together, it seems to me that the anti-scions, which look across here, and the contra-anti-scions, which look vertically, or listen vertically, mm -hmm. are variations on the theme of opposition. Mm -hmm. So let's take this point in Aries. It's directly opposite, let's say, the middle. The middle of Aries is opposite the middle of Libra. Mm -hmm. Now, opposition in Western astrology came to be a very stressful aspect, because you have two forces that are opposing each other. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to Babylonian astrology, the opposition was considered harmonious. Right. Because it linked two equal but opposite people, forces that could come together, bond together through some sort of agreement, contract, or negotiation. They could get married, for instance. They could join a business partnership. They could... Mm -hmm. It could be manifesting something, really. It's not, not, right. not necessarily something gentle, but yet um, something creating. Well, yeah, the word anti means sort of equal but opposite mm -hmm. uh, as a prefix. Yes. So that we have like, in philosophy, we have a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis. Mm -hmm. So the, the thesis and the antithesis sort of oppose each other. Mm -hmm. but they're not killing each other. They're working together to create something new and better. Yes. And I think that's more the Babylonian idea. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, in religion, we have the Christ and the Antichrist. <laughs> mm -hmm. So cool. when we talk about opposition, we're talking about two opposing forces that have the same stature, but mm -hmm. are opposing each other. But simply that they're opposing each other doesn't mean that something bad is going to happen yes exactly. because opposition is the basis of marriage mm -hmm. and without marriage the human species wouldn't survive right? at least in traditional terms yeah so it's the two opposite forces needing to recognize the other well libra if you think about it the the symbol one of the meanings of the symbol it's related to the law the mm -hmm. law is something that binds us to act legally, correctly. Like normally we might not want to, but we have to or face a penalty. So there's a sense of coercion or... And the symbol itself was originally, I think I'd read this in Greek, meant the yoke, like the yoke of two oxen that draw a cart. Mm -hmm. Their necks go in the yoke and that it forces them to work cooperatively together. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense with opposition that you have two forces left to their own devices. They could go astray and make a mess. Yes. But there's something that's constraining them 
and making them work together, whether it's vows of the marriage, religious principles, legal principles, uh, you know, or a binding legal contract and a business negotiation. Mm -hmm. so, so it isn't necessarily bad. It's, yeah. There's always some tension, but it's tension that can lead to a productive outcome. Mm -hmm. so I think there's also similarity, right? Because we say coldest cold is, <laughs> you know, as hot as the hottest hot and so right. on. The, 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 the prefix anti refers to opposite, but also of equal stature. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you take a poison, say a snake bites you, mm. I give you an antidote that's just as powerful as a snake's poison, but neutralizes it. Yes. So that's a good example of an opposition. <laughs> yes. You take the poison, the snake bites you, I give you the antidote, the antidote and the toxins from the snake fight each other, neutralize each other, and you live. So it's a painful process, there's a struggle going on, but the outcome is good. And so if you look at it, from this point to this point is an opposition in the zodiac. But from this point to this point is an opposition along a line of latitude of the earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from this point to this point is an opposition along a line of longitude of the earth. Mm -hmm. So these are sort of mundane or earth-based oppositions as opposed to zodiacal oppositions. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I think I have a picture of the earth here. Mm -hmm. Say Libra's... Well, Libra, yeah, Libra's up here, <laughs> Aries is down here, or whatever. Mm -hmm. If we go along this line, we're getting an opposition along the Earth's surface. Mm -hmm. This point is opposite this point. If we go this way, say, we're getting this point is opposite this point with the equator in the middle. So there's a sense of oppositions being repeated, but on different surfaces with respect to different circles. Yes. Um, this, what I did was I took a chart for today and I mapped the signs along the zodiac and superimposed it on the earth. Here's the equator. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, midday, this is the meridian. Uh, and so you can see Libra is across from which should be across from Pisces. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Aquarius is across from Scorpio and Capricorn is across from Sagittarius. Mm -hmm. And so because of the symmetries, this sign is symmetrical to this. They have something in common. This sign is symmetrical to this. They have something in common. Same here. If we had continued the Zodiac behind the earth here, you'd see that, uh, Libra down here matches up here behind the earth because the zodiac is 23 and a half degrees mm -hmm. with Virgo up here and so on, right? Yes. Here we have uh, Pisces up here, you'd have Aries. Mm -hmm. You can't see it because the earth is obscuring it. And so we have these symmetries which then link the signs and give them something in common. Yes. Okay, let's talk about Firmicus Maternus because he gives a very extensive discussion of this and he's fourth century. So he's, the, the concept has been well developed by the fourth century. You know, mm -hmm. If it goes back to Babylonian times or Hipparchus, we're talking about hundreds of years of development. Mm -hmm. um, and so let me just read this. Firmicus Maternus, if any stars do not aspect or behold one another in the orderly arrangement of nativity, it must be inquired whether they are connected by the associated aspect of anti-scions. So he, he calls it an aspect, which is interesting. Yes. When they have sent their anti-scions, thus they are connected with each other through their anti-scions, just as by a trine square opposition or sextal. So he's saying these anti-Sion contacts are the equivalent of all the Ptolemaic aspects. They're just as powerful and just as important. Uh, this is very interesting. This yeah. is very interesting. Rhetorius of Egypt a couple centuries later, 
talks about affinity and uh, the sinistry here. Their signs are an aversion. Uh, what can help them overcome this aversion is that they're ruled by the same planet. We've said that before. Or the symmetrical about the cardinal points, which mm -hmm. is the anti-science and contra-anti-science. Mm -hmm. uh, da, da, da. Let me go down. Uh, this was Rhetorius. Where was I? Okay. Continuing Rhetorius. Signs that are disjunct or an aversion, but having sympathy for each other are the equal rising sign, signs of equal ascension, and those of equal power, which are the antitial signs because they have the same amount of light. Mm -hmm. um, and then he lists them, okay. And he talks about sympathetic squares. So he says, this is interesting because normally we think squares are really, really stressful. Yes. But with the fixed signs, they're all either an anti-scion or contra-anti-scion relationship with each other. So maybe squares between fixed signs aren't so bad as between the other signs. Mm -hmm. There's something that mitigates their, the stressfulness. Paulus mm -hmm. in the fourth century says that in sinistry, the antitial signs that see each other can indicate harmony, characterized by sympathy and friendship. Mm -hmm. So if I see you and you look like, I think, you know, it's like visiting a foreign country and you meet somebody from your own country. Even though they're a stranger, they feel, you feel comfortable with them because there's something familiar about them. Yes. They share your, how you dress, how you groom yourself, how you, you know, your culture. Yeah. Where Taurus the squares between equal rising signs also have more sympathy. So there's something, there's an affinity or friendship or a, Similarity helps them connect with each other. Connect. And one interpretation is that the signs that hear each other, the equal rising signs, communicate well. They share news, rumors, etc. The other thing that's said about the equal rising signs, often they indicate uh, fugitives and um, traveling abroad. And I'm not sure why that is. It may be because one will be below the equator and the other above the equator. And maybe mm -hmm. there was this idea that people below the equator, because this is all developed above the equator, are these like strange foreign people. Like in Alexandria, below the equator, you'd have African tribes with a very different culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. So here's an example. Let me get rid of this. <laughs> From Mat Firmicus Maternus. Uh, he gives this example. This was his patron, a Roman consul who got in trouble for, he, he got charged with adultery and got convicted of it and got exiled. Mm -hmm. And so Maternus says, gee, if you look at his chart without the anti-science, it looks like he's going to have this wonderful life and I don't see the exile, but let's look at the anti-science and we'll see the exile. Mm -hmm. And so he just gives the birth data. I estimated the chart to be 303 AD, March 14th, it, late at night in Rome. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna, gonna, so here is the chart I reconstructed from the text. He doesn't give the chart in the text. So this is my reconstruction with whole sign houses. Mm -hmm. um, and he didn't use modern planets, obviously. So, Scorpio rising, Venus and Taurus in the seventh. So you'd think he would have great relationships with women, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Jupiter conjunct the sun with Jupiter and Pisces. Well, that looks really good. Moon is own sign Cancer in the ninth. That looks really good. So he said the same thing happened to this guy's father. He got exiled. So you'd think that his father would be prosperous, fortunate, and powerful. But in fact, he had many enemies and was exiled. How do we understand that? Maternus says the son is the basic symbol for the father. Mm -hmm. And so his father should be really in great shape. Conjunct Jupiter with Jupiter and Pisces. Mm -hmm. uh, one problem, he says, is Saturn opposes this. So you've got the Saturn causing problems. But then he says the aspect of anti-scion transfers the force and power of both Jupiter and the sun 
from Pisces into Libra. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, right, so the anti-sign of Pisces is in Libra. So it's as if these two planets, even though they're in such good state here, had their shadows in the 12th house. Yeah, the 12th is also prisons, right? Isolated prisons, prisons. exiles, and Libra is, is the fall of the sun. The sun, and Rahu is also there. Right. So there's the North Node, yeah. The North Node is there, Rahu's there. And so this, literally, they're taking quite, the sun is fallen. So he's fallen from grace, he's fallen from power, he's, he's just in disgrace. So you would expect the father at some point in his life to fall from, from public uh, admiration into disdain. Yeah, the fifth house is also in Vedic astrology considered as the fall from royalty because it's the eighth from the tenth house. Ah, okay. So, the, but I don't um, think the Hellenistic guys thought that, but yeah, but it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Anthony, um, now the sun is in Pisces, and we say by um, Anticia, right, it's in Libra. I mean, it has its reflecting point. Right. In its shadow is in Libra, and its shadow acts like a planet. It acts like the sun. Yeah, so what is it then in certain, yeah, in certain, because of that position in certain situations, it's going to act like a debilitated sun. Right. In other words, there's a hidden chart within this chart, and the hidden chart has a sun in the 12th house in Libra in its fall. So yes. in the hidden chart, which is the anti-science chart, the father is in disgrace and in exile. This is almost like a, a whole sign concept. It isn't so much the exact position of the sun. It's just the fact that the sun is in the sign Libra in the 12th house. Yes. That's what it's interpreting. Right. Mm -hmm. Clear. Yeah. Which is, so that's one. So then he says, oh, I said, he doesn't use this, but Saturn traditionally has ruled the, the, um, how the, mm -hmm. the father rules the fourth house and Saturn opposes the sun and Jupiter. Mm -hmm. Virgo Pisces but what he's what Maternus says is Saturn has its anti-scion Virgo in Aries right mm -hmm. it's debilitation and sign so is Ketu the south node yes so you've yeah. got a Saturn Ketu combination in the sixth house not good for the father <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> um so they, they considered the fourth house of the parents. Yeah, that's interesting. Right, the parents. The fourth house was, it was your foundation, your lineage, yeah. or your parents. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah, interesting. So let's move on. Let's see, where am I? Next one. So he uses the anti signs as stand ins for the planets, as if they were the planets themselves. Yeah, wow. Well, mm -hmm. um, now, that use, I think, has fallen out in modern times. They tend to use just the point. Mm -hmm. But he's saying, you know, if the anti is there, it's as if the planet is there. I think it's uh, very interesting that, you know, in terms of looking at transits, certain moments things happen and we also, you know, we, we tend to look for some explanation, right? Mm -hmm. um, but at a certain point, looking at my own charts, I saw these specific points being triggered and it really triggered off. And I thought, yeah. wow, it was not visible at all. It was not clear from other aspects. Mm -hmm. Now he talks a little about the adultery. How do we see the adultery? Uh, so this is his boss got exiled because of the crime of adultery. Well, he says, to begin with, in the natal chart, we, we do have Mars square Venus. So there's some problems with women here, mm -hmm. just by the square. But he says, let's look at the anti-scion of Mars and the contra anti sign of Mars. Mm -hmm. The anti sign of Mars, Aquarius has this reflection in Scorpio. Mm -hmm. So he didn't use Uranus, but that just happens to be there. Yeah. Um, so this is as if Mars is in Scorpio because the, the whole force of Mars then is also in Scorpio as well as in Aquarius. But if Mars is in Scorpio, the anti sign is opposite the Venus. So not only is there a square, but there's an opposition. So it's like a double whammy. Right. Um, now in terms of degrees, Mars is at 11 Aquarius, so it's anti-sign is 18 of Scorpio. 
and Venus, I think, is at about 10. So it's really not a perfect opposition. Sure, it's been yeah. eight degrees apart. So he's mm -hmm. using whole sign aspects here. Right. Sure. Uh, but he says th this opposition, uh, Venus is at 937. Okay. So you've got the square natally, and you've got the opposition through the anti-scion whole sign. So this guy's going to have trouble with women, no question. Venus has her anti-sign in Leo. Venus, the Taurus reflects to Leo. And Leo is opposite Aquarius. So not only is Mars the anti-sign opposite Venus, but the anti-sign of Venus is now opposite Mars. Opposite Mars. I think what's also interesting is that the eighth lord is Mercury. I mean, mm -hmm. of intimacy and so on, hidden things. Yeah. And, but that's also um, aspecting Scorpio, also opposing Venus as the eighth lord then of um, having all these connotations in Scorpio. So Right. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, you know, it, this square natally might not look so bad, but when you consider the anti-science and form this giant fixed cross involving Mars and Venus, this guy's going to have trouble with women. And Venus happens to rule the 12th, which is the house of exile. They're equivalent to the Ptolemaic ad. They're equivalent to major aspects. It's just as important as a trine or a square or an opposition. So They're why not. did it get lost in um, modern astrology? Or has it been? I mean, because I'm not really well, aware I think of the it has. I think it has been, yeah. I mean, it may be that the translations weren't available so that a lot of this stuff has been translated in the past 20, 30 years with yeah. the resurgence of interest in these techniques. So it may be that some of this material just wasn't available or wasn't understood. Right. And in fact, as you read the literature, there were a lot of misunderstandings, like mm -hmm. we saw with Ptolemy and Manilius. And, right? Now, I think Deborah Holding in the paper you mentioned, she talks about this same chart, and this is what she says. Mm-hmm. Firmicus gives no degree positions. The moon is positive in Cancer, which is really good. Yeah. The ascendant is in Scorpio. Mars is in Aquarius. By aspect alone, there would be no connection between the moon and Mars. Okay. They're, they're in there. Mm -hmm. However, the anti scion of the moon, which is in Cancer, falls in Gemini mm -hmm. yes. in the eighth. Uh, and this aspects Mars by trine. So you got a moon trine, anti sign moon trine Mars. And I think I think Saturn squaring that would be more telling than yeah. a trine a nice trine from Mars. I mean, in my right. opinion. But mm -hmm. yeah. uh, let's see what is she saying. Right. The anti sign of Mars is in Scorpio, right here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Trine the moon. Mm-hmm. And Maternus regarded the, the moon Mars trine as problematic. Yeah, it would be interesting to find that out because, you know, that would be completely um, going against what yeah. the trine naturally, I mean, represents. William Lilly. Let me just quickly give an example from Lilly. This is a horror example. Mm -hmm. Lilly says there are anti sia or anti scions, which of the good planets are equal to a sextal or trine. So a connection like the Venus or Jupiter is like a trine. And there are contra anti -scions, the oppositions of the anti -scions, which are the nature of a square opposition. Right, okay. That's Lily. And that, that has entered modern astrology, and a lot of people follow that. Mm -hmm. John Frawley, uh, he's, do you know him? He's a modern horror astrologer. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's very much into Lily. Uh, he says that anti sign contacts with planets or house cusps must be nearly exact, he says, within a couple degrees. Uh, and that's different from Maternus, who used either whole sign or wide orbs, like that Venus opposite Mars with about eight degrees apart. Like Maternus, Frohly says that a planet's anti science works as if the planet itself were in that place. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they carry a sense of the hidden, which is very much Maternus. It's like this hidden dimension to the chart. Mm -hmm. Uh, Frawley says, and this was interesting, I don't know why he said this, anti science do not show in a horary pregnancy or death. Although Lily said that the ascendant ruler 
conjunct the anti-scion of, of the eighth house, Lord of the eighth, is an argument for death. You know, Anthony, in, in Vedic astrology, we have um, Rashi aspects, which are also sign-based aspects, or so the signs aspect each other in a certain way based on modality. So this is an example, and this is way back when I was doing Hori. This is how I put my book on Hori about the importance of Anticia. There was a, a big plane crash in 1996, mm -hmm. and they happened to report the time it took off, the time it disappeared from radar, et cetera. So I thought that would be an interesting chart to look at. Definitely. And it disappeared from radar. They had the to the second, two hours, 13 minutes, 42 seconds PM. And this was near Miami mm -hmm. and all on board were killed. Mm. Uh, so here is the chart for the plane crash when it disappeared from radar. Uh, so Mercury is a 26 of Taurus and rules the ascendant. Mercury's in the ninth, which is travel. The anti sign of Mercury is at almost four of Leo, three of Leo 39, which is where almost exactly opposite Uranus. So that's not good. <laughs> The ascendant ruler opposite Uranus. The anti sign, the contra anti sign of Mercury is right on Uranus yes. within less than a degree. Opposing Uranus, yeah. Mm -hmm. The fixed star Algol, which is the head of the Medusa, this is in Hori one of the worst stars you can be connected with because Perseus cut the Medusa's head off and there mm -hmm. symbolized beheading, violence, sudden death, mm -hmm. things like that. It's a 26 Taurus right on Mercury, the ascendant ruler, look at that. Wow. Algol is 2606, Mercury is 2621. So it's almost exact conjunction. Wow. Which means that the contra sign of Algol beheading is also on yours. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. It began to smell smoke at 2.10 p.m. according to the news reports and the part of Saturn and Hellenistic astrology, part of Nemesis, at that moment that they smelled smoke in the plane and knew something was bad was happening, was a 26 Taurus 14. <laughs> and this is 26 Taurus 21, and the uh, echo is 26 Taurus 06. So this to me was amazing. Yes. Uh, yes. And. Uh, I won't get into the last part. I also see the sixth lord of accidents is debilitated in Aries. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the eighth house. In the And on the, I think this is a regiment, exactly on the cusp of the eighth house in the quadrant system. Exactly. In the eighth whole sign, but exactly on the, in Hori, aspects of the cusps are considered important as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so this is, Oh, this is a personal example. Mm -hmm. So I told you I had a knee injury a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So here's my natal chart in the middle. Mm -hmm. And at the this is the chart. I timed the knee injury, so I have the chart for when it happened. Venus, which happens to rule my ascendant and also mm -hmm. my eighth house, <laughs> by transit, its anti-scion is conjoining Saturn. Mm-hmm at the moment of the accident, natal Saturn. And Saturn can be falls and injuries to bones and joints. So that, to me, that was interesting that uh, That's at the strange. moment I had the accident, my ascendant ruler, which is my body, is by anti -scion, right on top of natal Saturn. Yes, and also what is this um, transiting Saturn is opposing? Is it opposing? Oh, yeah. You're in Saturn? Saturn and Pluto are opposing natal Saturn. And you know, um, and, and Mars and, is approaching a conjunction. <laughs> and Capricorn is also Denise. Right, yeah. Wow. So, but at the moment of the accident, Venus was going right over Saturn by anti Scion. So, your ascendant lord and also oh, your aid lord. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what's this one? Oh, this I thought was, there, tomorrow there's a total solar eclipse. Yes. So I thought we should look at the anti science and the solar eclipse. I said it for Washington because I live in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so the eclipse has Mars, has Scorpio rising, Mars rules the ascendant. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it looks kind of ominous that in Washington, Uranus is exactly on the descendant, opposing the ascendant. Mm -hmm. That's like sudden trouble of some sort. Mm -hmm. Mars rules the ascendant. And Mars is up here at zero of Leo, conjunct Mercury at three of Leo. Uh, so the anti-scion of Mars is 29 Taurus, and the anti-scion of Mercury would be at 27 Taurus. Taurus. Um, Taurus, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Leo Taurus. Am I doing that right? Um, yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes mm -hmm. a little confused. Um, yeah. So it's near Uranus also. And remember the star Kappa oh. Elwell, <laughs> the beheading star, the sudden violence. It's at 26 Taurus 25. So these two planets by anti -Sion, are very closely conjunct Algol in Taurus, which is over here, in the terms of Saturn. Yeah, it's not really close to Uranus, but Uranus is there in the same sign. But, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Algol itself, when you have contacts to Algol, usually something bad happens, something ominous and possibly violent or mm -hmm. dangerous. And so it's, well, it, Algol has come to symbolize sudden death, beheading, misfortune, mob violence, murder, sickness, etc. Mm -hmm. So this is the eclipse as it falls on Washington, D.C. Wow. Looks like something bad is going to happen. On account of that. But then you also have, like, for example, Saturn is strong in its sign, trining that point. Mm -hmm. uh, Mars is sextiling that point. So as the two malefics, would it kind of mitigate? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, it would be like... Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Um, and good dignity. Um, so on account of being... It probably would mitigate it some, yeah. The other thing, all of this is happening in the ninth house, basically. Mm -hmm. A lot of it in the ninth house. Some so rel religious could, stuff? Could be another air disaster of some sort. Or, this is the um, astrocartography map for this eclipse. Mm -hmm. And so Mars and Mercury are going straight through the sort of the, not the center, the central time zone of the country. Mm -hmm. Saturn and Pluto right in the middle of the country. The Uranus is right along the coast. And uh, the, the, the Mars and Uranus kind of meet down here in Central America. There's been a lot of issues about immigrants. So it'll be interesting how this plays out. Um, you gave so much information. It um, was very eye-opening also, and also in the way I look at Rashi aspects and so on. Um, I really love this um, because it makes sense astronomically and we see it really play out also that it has a concrete uh, effect. And so I'm definitely going to use this in my own practice a lot more. I'm going to investigate also like aspects and so on, what is actually going yeah, on. I, I think we have to investigate because the tradition has been to use just the points and, and yes. the conjunctions and oppositions, but clearly the literature uses whole sign aspects and aspects mm -hmm. with wide orbs and you know, in the Rashi aspects are, if you know, the Navamcha are just a way of dividing. I mean, it's just dividing the sign, a sign into nine equal parts. So it's not, not, it's not like a Navamcha or anything. It's just one Navamcha is three degrees, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so a planet at, uh, for example, Scorpio or at Aries at one degree Aries mm -hmm. is going to Rashi aspect, a planet at 29 or in the ninth Navamcha mm -hmm. of Scorpio see so it's the same yeah. it's the same concept yeah. and so in terms of looking at trigger transit or exact transits it's mm -hmm. important like when you know an event will hit you know well when, when a planet will exactly hit by Rashi aspect it's going to be important you know to see when that uh, thing is actually going to manifest the day it's going to manifest and yeah. so mm -hmm. do, you, do you do much with symmetry comparing two people's charts because yes I do that, that is a big theme in the literature that these, the anti-scion con contacts were seen as connections between people that united them when there weren't other factors in the chart that would indicate it. And I did read one article by a, a modern astrologer who said, I think it was a woman, that she has noticed, for instance, between parents and children, mm -hmm. often there are strong anti-scion contacts between the two charts, and certainly between spouses and partners. Mm -hmm. Let's take this chart, even though it's not two people. Mm -hmm. let's take the moon or let's take Venus. Okay. Yeah. Relationships. 
Uh, the anti-sign of Venus, it's, it's Gemini, so it has its anti-sign in Cancer. And it's like the first degree of Cancer. Mm -hmm. Right, because the end of Gemini would be the beginning of Cancer. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we would look at the other person's chart and see what lies one or two degrees of Cancer. Exactly. Uh, and say their ascendant is, or say their Mars is, or their, then that would be a very strong connection, right? So let, let's look at this chart. Here are the solstice points, the Antitia. So if you know somebody who has a planet or an angle at one of these points, mm -hmm. or for instance, the angles also have their antitia. So in this chart, the descendant, which has a lot to do with relationships, who you connect with, it has its antitia in Sagittarius, it was about 10, 11, 12, 13 degrees. So if you know somebody who has a planet at about 12, 13 of Sagittarius or an angle there, you probably would have a strong connection with them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the same you know, with the sun or the moon, the personal planet, Venus, Mars, anti-sign of your IC, your, the bottom of your chart, right? Yeah. Is it about 13 of Aries? Mm -hmm. My ascendant is at 12 of Libra. My descendant is at 12 of Aries. Right. So we have a strong bond right there. <laughs> yes. Your fourth house cusp, or your, you know, your meridian axis by mm. anti-cyan is right on my horizon. So that's a strong personal connection right there. You might look at your girlfriend's chart to see are any of her planets or angles connected to your anti-cyan degrees. Well, um, Scorpio, yeah, she's a Scorpio ascendant Scorpio. with um, Moon is there, so Moon is close to my Sun. Yeah, oh, Moon I, Sun is a classic marriage aspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting. Yes. And um, you have your descendant anti sign in uh, Sagittarius, mm -hmm. which is people at a distance, foreigners, people of a different culture. It's interesting. Yeah, and she has her Jupiter there right here on your descendant. But we teach together. So that's fascinating. You teach mm -hmm. together. And so the descendant is a partnership and the Jupiter is teaching the guru. You know? Exactly. And also you can look at, you know, how these plants connect by the outer aspects like trines connecting to these. Exactly. In industry. I think it would be um, very worthwhile investigating this a lot more. Yeah. And Maternus used the trine, you know, that trine he said was stressful with Mars and the moon. Uh, mm -hmm. But he's still using the trine of anti-science, so it's not just the the uh, conjunction and opposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So th I think there's a lot we have to learn and experiment with. And uh, it reminds me also of the Varshafall. You can look at Varshafall. You can bring it back to the natal chart. Look at you know connections there. Some people do, some people don't. It's just a matter of testing it all out and mm -hmm. see what really works. Okay, Anthony, you're going to do a webinar on this for the Kepler College. Kepler College is a, a teaching institution in the United States and the state of Washington that has trained a lot of astrologers. And part of their educational mission is offering webinars. And they have invited me to do a webinar. And I thought since I did all this work in preparation to talk to you, I would put it together as a slide presentation. And in Great. August this summer, yeah. presented for Kepler. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony, for being here. We'll discuss other astrological topics later. Till next time. Thank you. Okay, great. This was a lot of fun. Thank you.